Well, I'm not typical as a scientist because I'm afraid I have observed in many cases, in particular when scientists teach or give lectures, that they repress the emotion. They want to be factual, cool, all this that one usually associates with a scientist. But that is wrong. Scientists, science is a human, is a human uh, activity. And human activities are never cool. Uh, human activities are full of, of spur, of emotions, of fulfillment, and of tragedy. The visual impression of that explosion was enormous. I uh, think it was probably the most impressive experience I ever had in my life. How this hemisphere increased and increased, and then as the whole sphere detached itself from the Earth, white and then yellow and then orange, and most impressively, this big sphere was surrounded by a halo of blue light caused by the radioactivity. And at that moment, I was reminded of a picture by Matthias Grunewald, the ascension of, of Christ to heaven. He also pictured Christ in a ball like this, even with the blue halo around. And I was almost scared by this contrast between this instrument of death and the symbol of faith in Grunewald's picture. This program is about Victor Weisskopf. It is about the odyssey of an American physicist through the trauma of the 20th century. It is about his progress from the ivory towers of research to confronting both the good and bad consequences of his work. It is about the way science has changed our world and how he helped to catalyze these changes. It is about his apprenticeship at the birth of modern physics in the 1920s his work building the atomic bomb in the 40s, his international leadership in physics in the 60s, and his diplomatic efforts with the Pope and the President of the United States in the 80s. In 1908, Victor Weisskopf was born in Vienna, Austria. He was from a well-off bourgeois family, Viennese Jews deeply aware of Germanic culture, music, literature, philosophy. But this was also an era of change and revolution. Freud was probing the hidden depths of the mind. Einstein was creating a revolutionary new concept of the universe. Lenin was cultivating an organism for social change. Then, as Weisskopf turned six, the First World War erupted. His father fought at the Russian front, and Weisskopf remembers what it was like 70 years ago at home. The conditions during the war were really not so bad from the purely material point of view because we had enough money and so, but it was difficult, a family without father. And my mother did a wonderful thing. She hired a tutor. And this tutor uh, made a tremendous impression on me and on my, on my brother and sister. Indeed, he was the one who first introduced me to physics. And then I had an aunt, again, a great aunt who was a pianist. And I loved her dearly. And I was always sitting under her piano when she played. And the music came like water over me. And uh, this I cannot forget until now. <laughs> an event which was to signal the doom of the Austrian Empire 
and foretell the turmoil which would rack Europe and Weisskopf himself for three decades. It was uh, 1916 when the famous Emperor Francis Joseph died. And that was, of course, a tremendous event in Austria. My mother took us out to the Ringstrasse, where the big funeral was held, and we saw this. And I have still the picture in my mind of this great event. With the end of the war, Weisskopf's interest in science blossomed. I got from my parents a little telescope to watch the stars. And one night, a friend of mine and I went up a mountain and observed the, the Perseids, the, the falling stars, the shooting stars in, in August, and determined the different colors, red, green, blue. And then we sent this through an amateur organization, and it was published in the astronomical uh, journal, in a serious scientific journal. What an excitement for a 14-year-old boy to see his research published. At 18, Weisskopf went to Vienna University to study physics. But his professor there told him... In Vienna, you won't learn much physics. And the great modern physics now is going on in Göttingen, in Munich, or in Copenhagen. Why don't you go to one of those places? Indeed, in those places, a revolution was taking place in physics. Newton, 300 years earlier, had discovered the laws of gravity and motion. These laws of mechanics explained all observable motions in the heavens and on Earth. And so it was until the 20th century, when for the first time, experiments were able to reveal indirectly the submicroscopic world of atoms. The atom, it seemed, had a positively charged nucleus one trillionth of a centimeter across, orbited by negative electrons. According to Newton's laws, such an atom, with its positive and negative charges, must be pulled together and collapse. But it didn't. After 300 years of success, Newtonian mechanics was stumped. Niels Bohr in Copenhagen decided that a totally new mechanics was needed to explain why the atom didn't collapse. There must be new forces and laws of motion which operated at atomic dimensions. Bohr took the first mathematical steps to construct a new theoretical model of the atom based on a new mechanics. This was the start of the great new physics, of the Herculean task of actually discovering and connecting all these forces and laws which might in fact govern the new cosmos of atoms the laws and forces of quantum mechanics, which would revolutionize science in the 20th century. This was the world Victor Weisskopf was entering. So I went to Göttingen. I came there in 1928, when quantum mechanics was already there. But still, I got it quite new, not in form of lectures, but by conversation by talking to the professors. Not so much to the professors, because in Germany was sort of a big difference between the great professor and the little student, but to the young assistants. And those young assistants at that time in Göttingen became later the great physicists of the time. In these conversations with the assistants, they debated the new mathematical concepts and equations of quantum mechanics, the laws of atomic behavior. It was really a tremendously exciting time. We had to learn all these new developments, the Schrodinger equation, the new quantum mechanics. And at the same time, when we are barely able to understand this, came already the new developments, Dirac's relativistic wave equation, and the field theory. And every PhD thesis that a student was writing was opening up a field, which now then later on developed in a whole branch of physics. I like always to quote Churchill's famous statement a little, with a little variation. Never before have so few people done so much in such a short time. They indeed, I think they touched the nerve of the universe. Our understanding went really deeply into everything that's around us. At 21, Weisskopf, immersed in these new complexities, was advised by his supervisor you shouldn't be too much impressed by all that mathematics that you are learning in Göttingen. It's a simple thing, the idea that counts. 
Physics is simple but subtle, he used to say. And for me, I learned a lot to go to the essence of it and be somewhat wary of the mathematics that, they, that it surrounds it all. This advice was to guide Weisskopf for the rest of his life. While his mathematical work was indeed exceptional, his real genius lay on the intuitive side as a catalyst who connects key concepts and explains these connections to the mathematicians. Leipzig University in 1930 was Weisskopf's next stop. He went to work with Werner Heisenberg, who would later head the German atomic bomb project for Hitler. Heisenberg was uh, very agreeable to work with. Because, first of all, he was very young. He was only a few years older, may actually be exact. He was eight years older than I. And uh, so he was one of us. He was a very youthful character. He was in, uh, he, he played with us, not only physics, but also other things. He was, by the way, very musical. He played a lot of piano. And so he was one of us. And this uh, was a very agreeable situation. In 1930, parallel with the revolution in science, the Nazis were on the rise in Germany. There were riots at the university. Jewish students were beaten up and the police didn't come in to prevent it. Indeed, I saw it from the window of my office and sometimes I had to call in a poor fellow bloody in his face to save him. It was a difficult time. In 1933, the government of Germany was offered to Adolf Hitler. Providentially, at this time, Weisskopf was awarded a Rockefeller stipend to spend a year wherever he wished. He decided to go to Russia to see if the social experiment there was any better than the calamity which had overtaken Germany. My impressions were, for me, very healthy. I saw that Russia is not the solution, and that socialism was perverted there. So Weisskopf took off to Copenhagen with the rest of his stipend to work with Niels Bohr, the man who inspired and led the whole movement of quantum mechanics. It was fantastic, you know, to uh, see uh, Niels Bohr in the midst of these young, enthusiastic people who are uh, really attacking the most fundamental problems of nature with a spirit of, uh, with an enthusiasm and uh, with a freedom of conventional bonds. There was one thing I was sort of a little taking aback because they made jokes all the time and uh, practical jokes and other jokes. And I thought, boy, these are so wonderful things. Why do these fellows joke so much about it? And then he made this wonderful statement. There are things that are so serious that you can only joke about them. I don't think I knew any other physicist who was so human, who had so many personal relations with his co-workers. Indeed, that was his way of working. When you actually look at his publications, you don't really see what he did for physics because his most important influence was to have this group of co-workers around him with whom he discussed and in whom he planted those ideas. A typical example is Heisenberg's uncertainty relation, which was really Bohr's fundamental idea, but it was worked out by Heisenberg in this interesting collaboration spirit. I don't know of any other physicist who worked that way. I was lucky in Copenhagen in two respects. First, I met the great Niels Bohr who had a tremendous influence on everybody who ever got in touch with him. And then I also met my wife. I was warned before that the Copenhagen girls are very attractive. There is a rule, we call it a law, law of nature, that every physicist who went to Niels Bohr unmarried gets away with a Danish wife. And this rule had no exceptions. Weisskopf was then invited to Zurich. His work had impressed Wolfgang Pauli, a fellow Austrian. You cannot imagine what that means for a young physicist who just starts his career to be asked to be the assistant of Pauli. Pauli was the great man, apart from Niels Bohr and Heisenberg, the man who uh, was 
considered to be the critic, the sharp critic, the conscience of physics, as he was called, and he would ask me to work with him. So I was overwhelmed. Pauli's reputation proved to be all too real. The drama started when I arrived there. I opened the door, and then I said, wait, wait, wait. He, I, has to, I have to finish a calculation. So he was sitting on his desk on the other end of the room, finishing the calculation. Then he said, who are you? So I said, I am Weisskopf. He said, oh, yes, yes, I wrote you a letter to become my assistant. You know, actually, I wanted to get Hans Bethe. But Hans Bethe works on the physics of the solid state. And the physics of the solid state, I don't like, although I started it. He gave me then something to calculate, and after a week or ten days, he came to me and asked me, well, uh, what did you do? And I showed him what I did. He said, well, I should have taken Bethe after all. <laughs> His colleague, Scherer, whom I liked very much, it's another physicist there, who was well known to explain things in a very simple way. And I, as you, I have always interest in that. And once he came to Pauli, and I was present, and said, Pauli, look, I have a wonderful, simple way to explain this phenomenon. You know, the spin goes up and the other goes down, and then they interact, and isn't that simple? And Pauli said, yes, it is simple, but it is also wrong. So with all these sharp and nasty remarks and episodes I told you, I think one may get the wrong impression of Pauli. Pauli was a very warm, and I was almost, say, childish person in his relation to people. Indeed, all these stories show only that he always says what he thinks. And if you get accustomed to this, it's a wonderful thing to be together with a person who tells you exactly how he thinks. The new thinking of quantum mechanics, which mathematically explained how the atom held together, introduced concepts which had no direct analogy in our normal world. In this representation of the extraordinary world of the atom, an electron, for example, can mathematically behave both like this particle and like this amorphous cloud or wave field. The wave picture and the particle picture are both mathematical representations of the same phenomenon. They are complementary impressions or pictures of the atomic essence of matter. Bohr used to say, when we talked about this, uh, these different pictures, wave and particles, it is like uh, in painting. Uh, compare a Picasso picture of a person with a picture of Raphael of a person. Both pictures describe an important part of that person, and they are complementary to each other. These two different aspects Bohr liked to express in the following form. He says, there are two kinds of truth, a shallow truth and a deep truth. A shallow truth is a truth where the opposite is really false. A deep truth is a statement where the opposite also has a certain sense and application. Because quantum mechanics lays down the laws of atomic behavior, it is the scientific basis for understanding the properties of everything we see around us. The the results of quantum mechanics went further than just the properties of isolated atoms. Once you knew the structure of atoms, you also knew how the atoms stick together. How they, for example, stick together and form a piece of metal or a piece of rock. And then, why is the rock hard? Why is the metal hard? But it's, of course, not infinitely hard. And you could even estimate how high the mountains are because if they were on Earth. Because if they were higher, they would sink, they would plastically deform. So do you have here the resistance of the hardness of the mountains versus the force of gravity? And that gives you the maximum height of the mountains and it just comes out right. When I first encountered those new concepts of quantum mechanics, I and I'm sure everybody else must have been very disturbed. And these are new ideas, completely different from the old. You couldn't quite understand it. But as time went on and you went deeper into it, you saw that this really gives you the clue, an explanation, an insight, a much deeper insight into what's going on than ever before. And I often use the expression, a joy of insight. And I, this is one of the most beautiful feelings as a scientist. And it happens perhaps once a year when you 
find something new or when you hear something new and get the idea, understood something. You have this joy of now seeing deeper into the riddles. And without that joy, uh, the life of a scientist would be very dull. Now, these ideas of quantum mechanics were so inspiring, so deep, and so, I would say, uh, wonderful, that I believe it helped me a great deal and must have helped others, too, of my colleagues, to survive, to be mentally sane during this terrible time of Nazism and persecution in the 30s. He always had the idea that here is uh, something great. And I would, I often say to my students when they speak about the bad times, th there were two things that kept me alive and human. And this is, I usually say, it is Mozart and it is quantum mechanics. Now, in the late 30s, Hitler was embarking on the destruction of the Jews. Bohr, from the haven of Denmark, worked to help Jewish scientists get jobs in the safety of America. He almost went every year to America for giving talks, but at that time he went to America, we, we called it to sell his Jews, because he got money from American sources and also from European sources to keep us alive for stipends and so on. I myself spent a year uh, later on on such a a stipend, and I was sold by him to the University of Rochester. In 1937, Weisskopf came to the United States with an instructorship at Rochester University, but not before he had rejected a job offer in Russia. That was a full professorship with a lot of money, and they promised to pay a third one in dollar of my salaries and let me out if every year for several months. But I knew the Soviet Union. We were decided from the beginning that we will take the little job in America. And if I had taken the Russian job, I wouldn't be alive today. In 1939, Hitler launched World War II. Frightened by the possibility that Heisenberg in Germany might make an atomic bomb, America started work on this ultimate weapon of destruction. When America entered the war, Los Alamos in New Mexico became the world's first atomic bomb factory. Almost all the great American and European refugee scientists were recruited. They would extend their abstract theories of quantum mechanics into the practical work of building the bomb. The American physicist Robert Oppenheimer led and shaped this almost unnatural scientific effort. Oppenheimer was able to create from the ground up an institution in which science was used for destruction. At the same time, however, he was also able to create a spirit, an atmosphere of enthusiasm, of collaboration, and of great intellectual and moral purpose. And these two things are sort of contradictory, but in a way, it was that way. Pauli, my old teacher and friend, was one of the few, maybe even the only one, who refused to work on the nuclear project. Now the question is, was he right or was he wrong? Now in questions of morality, it's very difficult to be so exact about right and wrong. I think his idea was a fundamentally a very valuable one. Science should not be abused for anything that has to do with destruction and murder. But Weisskopf and the others did go to work on the bomb. Why did they feel differently? We felt that uh, it is a necessity. After all, we were in the middle of a war, or actually at the beginning of a war, where you uh, think more of what is necessary to def defeat that enemy of the world, Hitler. And therefore, we, are not, we were not uh, much thinking about the deep moralities of it. But to be frank, 
I'm sure there were other reasons, too. After all, I was a pretty young fellow at that time. I was not one of the leaders of physics. And all the great people went into this. And of course, there was a strong urge to be with them and to participate in this great experience that you can release the cosmic forces that were hidden in the nucleus. It has never been shown before, except in, in the center of the sun. <laughs> In May 1945, devastated by conventional bombs, Germany surrendered. The atomic bomb wasn't yet ready at Los Alamos. It was no longer needed to counter the German threat. But was it still needed to shorten the Japanese war? Did the scientists ponder this, or did their momentum simply carry them forward? There was an enormous, I would say, an almost kinetic energy in the laboratory. We all working day and night at this one aim. And now, from the moral point of view, I think, if this was really the reason why we were there, namely that to prevent Hitler from having a bomb, I should have quit. And I only talk about myself here. But I didn't. We were in the midst of something. Uh, it would have been almost impossible to leave. I would even have had a little guilt to leave the others alone when I would have run away at that time. In June 1945, the first atomic bomb was ready. But the test had an unexpected side. The test of the first nuclear bomb in the Alamogordo desert had to be postponed by about four hours. There was an intercom system, and that intercom system was the same wavelengths as a local radio station. And this was one of the most uh, grotesque and uncanny feelings I had when the countdown started. Ten, nine, eight, you heard the background music. The Nutcracker Suite by Tchaikovsky. Da 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 dum dum da dee. Whenever I hear that melody, the whole thing comes back to me. And then zero, and here was the explosion. by this uh, terrible sight, by the whole complex of problems that will come with all this. And of course, I was also impressed by the great success that we had. There's no denying that we were pride. There was a feeling of pride, awe, and distress. In August 1945, the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Well, in many ways, it changed my life, in many respects. First of all, as a scientist, before this, science was sort of an esoteric activity, I would say uh, ivory tower-like, independent of the rest, and this put, it, put us right squarely into the life of the nation, of the world. Secondly, of course, it raised the reputation of science. Uh, it was then very easy to get uh, good jobs and support for research, which are all things that are perhaps not of primary importance, but they are of importance. And third, it showed to all of us that the problems of life are not simple. Oppenheimer expressed it in this characteristic way, uh, we scientists have learned sin. I think that's a somewhat problematic way of expressing it, but it gives the, uh, the, the ambiance. It says what I meant to say, that we saw that things, all things are connected, the good and the bad. That science can, is not only for the good, it can also be for the bad. Victor Weisskopf had started to have second thoughts about the role of science in society. He began to feel that scientists had a responsibility to communicate with the public, to warn when science might be harmful, 
and to work for solutions to such problems. After the war, Weisskopf renounced atomic bomb work. He joined other scientists in an effort to achieve international control of nuclear weapons. But there was little public or political response at that time, and these concerns got nowhere. But it did set Weisskopf on a path which he would always follow. Meanwhile, the Cold War was developing, and the government and military had now learned the value of science applied to war. They poured money into research. Soon one out of every two scientists was supported by military grants. Even Weisskopf did some military work, albeit non-nuclear. World War II has shown that uh, those uh, egg-headed physicists are, can be quite useful. So let's support them so that in case of another war, we have them ready again. I think that was essentially the philosophy. There were very few strings attached to that money. Still, there were some of us, and I, I include myself, who were a little leery. We didn't like this idea that our great science now is almost exclusively supported by money coming from the armed forces. But it was a fact. Weisskopf had now gone to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology to teach and to write a textbook on theoretical nuclear physics. This book became the Bible for university students for two decades to come. Meanwhile, on the experimental side of physics, scientists were building bigger and bigger machines. Machines for particle research to probe into the nucleus, the very center of the atom. These cyclotrons, or accelerators, shoot beams of electrons and nuclear particles at great speed or energy to collide with other minute particles. It is one of the paradoxes of quantum mechanics that the smaller the object is, the higher energy do you need to get into it. That means also the, big, the larger instruments you need. And so the cyclotrons be began to grow. Before the war, every university could have a cyclotron. After the war, the new instruments, synchrotrons, accelerators became so big that the university can no longer afford it and they, it must be on a national scale. And then something came about which is called big physics. It means it is no longer the one man with a few assistants who does the experiment, but a whole team of 10 or 12 people supported by another 20 or 50 mechanics and engineers. One big physics institution was the European International Accelerator, CERN, in Geneva, Switzerland. Eventually, CERN's accelerator would circle for almost 20 miles in underground tunnels across the nearby frontier into France and back again. Weisskopf, with his strong international concerns, was a frequent visitor here. And just as the machine was coming up to full power in 1960, Weisskopf, though American, was now prestigious enough to be offered the directorship. He saw CERN as a means to extend international understanding and cooperation, at least in science. While at CERN, with the biggest research machine in the world, they needed a Weisskopf to inspire and lead their efforts. In the same way as Niels Bohr, Weisskopf's old mentor had inspired and led the work on quantum mechanics 40 years earlier. So I um, said, I'm interested in the job. Well, then I went to Paris, where there was a session of the council, of, of the International Council, and uh, they're looking me over, and one fellow asked me, do you have any administrative experience? And I said, pretty honestly, none whatsoever. But then I added, but I think that's my strength. <laughs> but as director, he was the chief administrator. And he found that his wartime experience at Los Alamos under Oppenheimer paid off. I think Oppenheimer helped me quite a lot. I mean, the way he was at Los Alamos. I sometimes imitated him quite consciously. For example, his being present at an important experiment at 3 o'clock in the morning. I did this literally at 3 o'clock in the morning. And uh, other things like uh, being there when important discussions are taking place. These discussions, 
and experiments related to shooting beams of subatomic particles through miles of accelerators, almost to the speed of light. Until they smash into their target. The results? Frozen and vastly magnified in photographic tracks reveal the strange fundamental building blocks of the universe. Particles which often measure but a trillionth of a centimeter across and sometimes exist for less than a billionth of a second. Translated into three dimensions by a computer, these are the particles created in the inferno of a 500 billion volt collision. An inferno similar perhaps only to that which occurred 20 billion years ago when our very universe exploded in the primal Big Bang of creation. When I think back at these five years, they are like 20 years of my life, but I enjoyed every moment. It was incredibly interesting from almost any point of view you can look at it. From the scientific point of view, you were really penetrating in a completely new and unknown realm. But, some ask, are these scientists, at great public expense, merely trying to solve hypothetical problems created only by their own machines? The problems are not created by the machines. They are only brought to us on Earth by the machines. Actually, it turns out that the same situations which we create at the machines are actually, do actually exist in exploding stars and even at the origin of the universe, probably. The two fields of physics, namely the beginning of the universe and the study of the elementary particles of matter, come together. At the beginning of the universe, there were enormously high temperatures, enormous intensities of light and pressure and high temperatures. And under these conditions, of course, matter is no longer together as it is now, but it is decomposed in the elementary particles. What this means is that at the target of our accelerators, where the particles hit matter, we create more or less the same situation as was in the first millions or even milli billions of a second in the universe. Findings from the studies of the limits of the galaxies and clues from particle collisions reveal evidence of a single cataclysmic beginning of the universe in a big bang. When I first uh, heard and read about all this evi evidence, I was sort of really impressed by it. It made me shudder. A kind of uncanny feeling that there should be a beginning. That things started out with a big explosion of light. Uh, it hits me very deeply and I think must hit everybody very deeply. But it hits me especially because I always remember Haydn's oratorio, The Creation, where he describes this beginning in so wonderful music with a big, strong C major chord which describes this first creation of light by God. It developed from a hot gas to the earth with the sun and uh, life, animals, and human beings. The more I see something 
sense. I see some sense in it, a development from the primitive to the complicated. And uh, I feel we, I see where life comes from, where I come from, where my origins are. That means here we see a creativeness of nature that even random processes can create new forms, new shapes, new animals and humankind. And in this I find a, a deep sense, a satisfaction, and also, I would say, a source of a certain moral attitude. Einstein said, the most incomprehensible fact is that we can comprehend nature. I feel he's absolutely right. But somehow just this miracle that we can comprehend nature is the basis for any scientific work. And it is this miracle that drives every true scientist to his work and to do more and to find out. And just that we can, that we are, in, that we are able to get more insight, more and more insight into nature. This is that miracle of which we live. After leaving CERN in 1965, where his success owed much to his great gift of scientific intuition and insight, Weisskopf was internationally acclaimed. He received the Legion d'Honneur, France's highest civil award. Then, back at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, he guided and developed the most prestigious department of physics in America. Again, he was able to use his scientific intuition. You need an intuition if, uh, uh, to, to explain, to simplify, to make clear a rather complicated mathematical connection. Uh, not, not only in order to explain it to students, but also to explain it to your colleagues so that they know what they are working with. Some people have it, some people don't. But there are quite a number of, that have it, and I consider them my special friends because these are those people through whom I can talk about these things. Whereas sometimes when I have ideas of this kind, uh, the different types say, well, uh, you again, some kind of silly speculations you are doing. You know? But these who are, think like me say, uh-huh, maybe I can help you and we do it together and develop something sensible. This property of mine has something to do with, uh, with a kind of irrationality in my thinking and a kind of emotional thinking because I do not especially like this very strict logical mathematical derivation. I like to go fast. Sometimes, of course, I go then the wrong way. Indeed, in his teaching, Weisskopf extends his intuition and irrationality, and he has a reputation for making mathematical mistakes, which just happen to cancel out. I am, of course, uh, not a perfect teacher, and that is why I'm making mistakes from time to time. But it is more than that. Uh, I am always concentrating on, on the general idea, on the great ideas, on the great connections. And the details bore me terribly, and therefore I, uh, I don't take much, put much attention to it and make mistakes then. Uh, these mistakes are sometimes quite good for the students because they have to find out where I made the mistakes, and that's quite instructive. But uh, my main point is to get the grand connections. For example, I, uh, whenever a field of my work becomes too specialized and too much knowledge is involved, I like to go to another field because I don't want to be an expert. I want to see the great connections. Uh, I prefer to know nothing about everything instead of knowing everything about nothing. I am not typical as a scientist because I'm afraid I have observed in many cases, in particular when scientists teach or give lectures, that they repress the emotion. They want to be factual, cool, all this that one usually associates with the scientist, but that is wrong. Scientists, science is a human, is a human uh, activity, and human activities are never cool. Uh, human activities are full of, of spur, of emotions, of fulfillment, or, and of tragedy. In 1974, 
Weisskopf, at age 65, became Professor Emeritus at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he became an international diplomat, an elder statesman of science. In 1976, he was elevated to the Pontifical Academy of Science to advise the Pope. In 1978, he received the National Science Award. Today, age 75, he spends half his time working at MIT. The other half, he uses to pursue his concerns about the state of the world. He sees today a growing number of problems arising from technology made possible by his beloved science. He wonders if our industrial civilization is suffering merely from adolescent growing pains or from a terminal disease. Technology in its adolescent years was only distinguishing between what is possible and what is impossible. And what is possible was usually done. My teacher, Max Born, who was a man of great wisdom, said we have now to distinguish among the possible what should be done and what should not be done, what is harmful and what leads to a crisis. You could speak of uh, the atmospheric pollution due to the development of technology. We can speak about uh, the damage we do to the environment, the eradication of forests, the, the climate, climatic changes are the consequences of it. The, the oceans who suffer from our industry, etc., etc. This was these were small effects a hundred years ago, and now they become really big global effects. What can we do to improve the situation? I think one of the conditions is to look at technical, at technological progress, and distinguish between stabilizing and destabilizing progress. Evidently. The weapons progress is destabilizing, but there are also other destabilizing progress. Take uh, the computer, for example. The computer can be extremely useful indeed. Any modern research couldn't be done now without computers. On the other hand, computers can be used in, uh, in um, destroying the privacy of people and in police supervision, in destabilizing fact, and of course it also can be used and is used very strongly in military, uh, in military actions. Are the environmental critics then right to blame science for today's problems? We need science. We need more science to find out what is harmful and what not. We cannot solve the pollution problem without more scientific knowledge. For example, where, where the CO2 goes and where it does not go and how to prevent it. And there's only one example. In medicine and in many other fields, we need more science. The more we know, the more we can distinguish between harmful and not harmful things. But it needs not only scientific knowledge, it also needs ethical and moral knowledge to be sure what we should do and what we should not do. Take uh, nuclear energy, nuclear reactors. There are many scientists, maybe not enough, who warn about possible accidents and, safe, and, and propose safety measures. But it is not he alone who can decide whether they are introduced or not. It's usually the industry that wants to cut corners and save money, and there's not enough regulation from the government to prevent this. So the scientists must work together with the public. And I think it begins now. It took a long time before the public understood these problems, and now they begin to understand it. So that's why I have some hope that things may become better. Today, Weisskopf works to influence the public through the Pontifical Academy of Science. He sees this group of scientists and physicians as being able, through the church, to galvanize public opinion around a particular set of views on the dangers of nuclear weapons. In the case of the nuclear problem, the scientists have a special responsibility because, first of all, they made it. Second, they know somewhat more about the effects and the way it works. And this is why I think, at least, that they must be much, they must think deeper about the consequences of what happens. Weisskopf sees his academy group speaking through the church and the pope to hundreds of millions of all faiths throughout the world. It, was, it is quite clear to me that the pope is very, was very interested in our work. Indeed, he asked us several times 
I mean the working group, to come to his office and discuss it personally with him. And also the fact that he used it all the time in his speeches shows that he is in great sympathy with our activities. One of the actions of the Pope was to send the delegations to the different heads of states. I happen to have been member of the delegation to President Reagan. And that was a very, I should say, curious experience. Uh, there were four members there, together with the the Nuncius, which is essentially the ambassador of the Vatican at uh, Washington. We came to the White House and uh, we had to wait a little and then we were ushered in and we weren't even asked to sit down. And we had only very little time to present our ideas and when I, who was a spokesman of it, when I said that, uh, Mr. President, you have received a letter from the Pope the president couldn't even remember that he did. And after 10 minutes, we were again shoved out of the room. But, Weisskopf feels, the American Catholic bishops have spoken out on this issue. Their moral imperative, he claims, has been heard. The declaration of the American bishops about a nuclear war, about deterrence, and about the importance of the moral and ethical points of view <coughs> was... Uh, not a great surprise to me because it was obviously influenced or at least parallel to the kind of efforts and discussions which we had at Rome. And um, I personally believe this is a great document and has probably contributed more than any other to a certain change in the public attitude and in, to the awareness. And if there is any ethical and moral problem of any importance, it is the nuclear war. So I believe the church would actually be uh, deficient in their duty if they did not take up that problem. In his odyssey through life in 20th century science, Victor Weisskopf has seen the world transformed. He himself has passed from abstract research to concern about the nuclear weapons which he helped create. Today, he looks to the methods of his beloved science in seeking his solution to this problem. In my relatively long life, I had unfortunately the experience of uh, having seen, directly having witnessed two oppressive regimes, the Nazi regime and the Soviet regime. They were both terrible, but the Second World War was an opportunity to end the Nazi regime, and indeed we were successful. I believe, however, that the uh, invention of the nuclear weapon has changed the situation. No longer is it possible now to get rid of an objectionable, of a hateful regime by military means. This is just over. We can't do it anymore because it is the same, it is equivalent to suicide if that other regime also has nuclear weapons, as it is the case here. There is a monument in Vienna where there is an inscription in Latin, civis pacem parabellum, which means if you want peace, you must prepare for war. If you look at this statement in the present state of affairs, it just reminds me from, of the fact that you have to change your ideas as you do in science when a new problem arises. This principle was all right in the old days with the old kind of war. If you apply it to a nuclear war, it is suicide. Einstein says that the unleashing of atomic power has changed our whole world, but has not changed our thinking. And this is a statement which is a very important one. Indeed, due to the fact that nuclear bombs exist, we ought to change completely our attitude towards, what, towards war and aggression and, oppo and opponents and political problems. This change of attitude has not taken place. I believe as a scientist to be able to say something about this because of the re following reasons. In science, very often we stand before such a complete change of, sit of a situation. For example, at the beginning of quantum mechanics, when it was absolutely impossible to explain and to understand what happens within an atom. And then a new way of thinking, a completely new way of thinking, which was almost contradictory to the old way of thinking. 
certainly not compatible with the old way of thinking, had to be introduced. And I believe in politics and in world affairs, we are now exactly at this point where we have stopped to think the way we did before nuclear bombs were invented. If we don't succeed in preventing the nuclear war, this century will be remembered as the time of the great catastrophe and science will be regarded as the main culprit. This century should be remembered as a time where humanity got its deepest insights in the nature of the universe and was able to control its martial impulses.